Hi, my name is Peter Gartland, and today I'm going to be presenting finding large induced sparse subgraphs and C sub greater than T free graphs in quasi polynomial time. Okay, so I'm going to start by talking about the uh, independent set problem a little bit. Um, if you need a quick refresher on what that is, uh, I have this graph over here off to the right hand side. And we can see that the blue vertices here make an independent set because there's no edge going between any two of the blue vertices in this graph. Um, in fact, these blue vertices make a maximum independent set because there's no independent set on more than three vertices in this graph. Um, now for the maximum weight independent set problem, um, the vertices on this graph uh, all get a number associated with it called its weight. And our goal now is to find a maximum weight independent set, meaning that if we took all the individual weights of the independent set and summed them up, we want that number to be as big as possible. Okay, um, so the maximum weight independent set is a classic MPR problem. This is one of CARP's original 21 MP complete problems. Um, so one way to deal with MPR problems is to restrict the kinds of inputs that we allow into our algorithm. All right, so in that direction, uh, we had the following problem, which until recently was open. And that is, what is the complexity of maximum weight independent set on PT free graphs? And a PT free graph is going to be a graph which has no induced path on T vertices. Okay, so let me uh, refresh your memory on what it means to be an induced graph. Um, so we have down here, this is a path on six vertices. So this is a P6. Here, these black vertices make an induced P6 now in this graph. And now though, when I add this red edge in here, um, it's no longer an induced P6 in this graph. All right, and we can generalize this definition to H-free graphs, right, where H can be any graph that we want. So an H-free graph is going to be a graph that contains no induced H, right? So for instance, a uh, C6-free graph would be a graph that contains no induced cycle on six vertices. Um, but uh, Gorlin and Loshinov, the first two authors in this paper that I'm presenting today, um, in 2020, gave a quasi-polynomial time algorithm for the maximum weight independence of problem on PT free graphs. Um, and this uh, implies, strongly implies, uh, that this problem is in P, uh, although this is still an open problem whether or not this is actually in P. Um, so there's two natural uh, follow-up questions to this result. One is that, can we extend this algorithm of garland Lokshinov uh, to work on more general graphs than just PT free graphs. And the second natural question is, can we extend this algorithm uh, to answer problems other than uh, the maximum weight independence set problem? Right? Like for instance, maybe we want to find the maximum weight induced planar subgraph. All right, so our main result is that, um, our main result of this paper that I'm presenting shows that the answer to both one and two is yes, and they can even be done simultaneously. All right, so let me state the main result. So we have that for every pair of integers D and T and county monadic second order logic sentence phi, CMSO2 sentence phi, um, there exists an algorithm that given a C sub greater than T free graph, G, and that means that G is a graph that has no uh, induced cycle of length T or more. Um, uh, with weight sense vertices, right, so G has weight sense vertices, um, then in quasi-polynomial time, uh, this algorithm finds a maximum weight uh, subset S of vertices of G, uh, such that S induces a D-degenerate subgraph and S satisfies phi, right? So these um, two def uh, these two words that I have in red, um, I'll be giving the definitions of those things momentarily, um, but first let's explore some of the implications of what this statement is saying. Uh, so in addition to maximum weight independence set problem, this algorithm can answer problems like maximum weight induced planar subgraph, um, minimum weight feedback vertex set, uh, something like you know minimum deletion to not less graphs with let's say minimum degree three and maximum degree 10, um, or really just to give you a flavor of how uh, strong uh, county monadic second order logic can be. Uh, this algorithm can answer a problem like maximum weight induced subgraph that can be embedded in the projective plane so that the number of vertices in the union of any two overlapping two connected components is four mod 11. Right, or really 
any other problem that can be formulated in CMSO2 logic that you can think of, really, this algorithm itself. Um, of course, we have to meet this degeneracy requirement, right? So our target um, set of vertices has to induce a degenerate cell graph. OK, so I promise you some definitions. Um, the first one is degeneracy. Uh, so a graph is degenerate if you can keep on deleting vertices uh, of degree at most d until we get an empty graph. So some example of this, independent sets are zero degenerate. I can, if I have an independent set, I can keep on deleting vertices of degree zero until I get an empty set. Forests are one degenerate. I can keep on deleting a leaf in a forest until I get an empty set. Planar graphs are five degenerate, right? Every planar graph has a vertex of degree five or less. It's a well-known theorem about planar graphs. So I can, keep, I can keep on deleting that vertex of degree five or less until I get an empty set. And let me give you a quick example of a two degenerate graph. I have this graph here. I'm going to remove one of the leaves of degree one, right? Remove the other leaf of degree one. Now I remove a vertex of degree two. Remove another vertex of degree two. Remove a vertex of degree one. Remove a vertex of degree zero. Okay, so that graph has uh, it's a two degenerate graph. And there's an important alternative definition that is well known about degeneracy, um, and that is that uh, if there exists an ordering of the vertices, right? I can number the vertices one through n. Um, so that no vertex has more than d neighbors to its right. Um, and how do we see that? Well, uh, I mean, <clears throat> all we have to do is just look at the deletion ordering of the vertices that we give. Right. Once I delete a vertex, it can have at most d neighbors, and those are precisely the neighbors that are to the right, the ones that get a number bigger than that vertex. All right. Uh, so that's degeneracy. OK, so the second definition is uh, county monadic second order logic. Uh, so CMSO2 is the county monadic second order logic of graphs. Uh, it's a standard language, uh, standard logical language for formulating graph properties. Um, so CMSO2, it has this notion of basic atomic formulas. Um, and some of these basic atomic formulas would be things like checking for set membership. Um, it can check if an edge is incident to a given vertex. Or I can check something like a uh, set has size has a given size modulo p. Um, and these basic atomic formulas, they can be built up using Boolean operators and quantifiers to make complex logical statements. Uh, so many graph properties can be coded as a CMSO2 formula phi. So examples, right, we have some subset S of vertices of a graph G, and we can say, well, we can ask, uh, does the set of vertices S induce an independent set? Or we can ask, does S induce a connected set? Um, we can say, does, does our graph G, is it a planar graph? We can ask, is S, uh, does it induce a knotless graph? All right, so these last two conditions here are going to be based on the fact that they have a, uh, a finite forbidden minor formulation, right? Planar graphs and knotless graphs. Um, okay, so let's take a look at, at an example CMSO2 statement. Um, so this is a CMSO2 statement checking if a uh, subset S of vertices of G is an independent set. All right, so we can, we can see that phi, our CMSO2 statement, it takes as input this set S and it checks for the following, right? It says that for all X that belong to S and for all Y that belong to S, um, it is not true, right? We're taking the negation here. It is not true that there exists an edge E um, such that, and this statement right here, this is one of these atomic formulas. Um, this stands for incidence, right? Is X incident to E? Right, so checking if E is an edge is incident to X and Y is an edge incident to X. All right, we can see that this is going to value to true if and only if S is independent, right? The same as if, if for all X that belong to S and all Y that belong to S, it is not true that there exists an edge such that X and Y are both incident to this edge simultaneously. And that's precisely what it means to be independent. All right, so this is going to value to true if and only if S is independent. All right, so um, let me state the main result again and see if we can digest this a little bit better. Uh, so we have that for every pair of integers d and t and county monadic second order logic uh, two sentence phi, um, there exists an algorithm that given a c sub greater than t free graph g with weights on its vertices and quasi polynomial time finds a maximum weight subset s of vertices such that s induces a d degenerate subgraph and s satisfies phi. All right, so this algorithm is going to find the maximum weight subset S of vertices so that right, S induces a degenerate subgraph. And when I plug in S to phi, phi is going to evaluate to true. 
All right. Um, so independent set is one of the most important problems that this algorithm can solve. So let me recap some polynomial time results for the independent set problem. Uh, so on P4 free graphs, uh, we had the Cornell et al. in uh, 1981 gave a polynomial time algorithm right, for independent set problem P4 free graphs. Uh, Loshnov et al. in 2014 gave a polynomial time algorithm for P5 free graphs. Uh, and Gretzik et al. in 2019 gave a polynomial time algorithm for independent set on P6 free graphs. Right then for claw free graphs, uh, Chibi and Minty simultaneously in 98, um, 1980, sorry. Uh, gave polynomial time algorithm for independent set on these claw free graphs. Uh, for four free graphs, this was done by Alexeyev in 2004. Um, and then Lozen and Milnick extended this in 2008 to also work for weighted independent set. Um, and then in 2020, Avrashimi et al. Uh, gave a polynomial time algorithm for the independent set problem on C sub greater than five free graphs. Uh, some other results uh, Chudnovsky et al in 2019 gave a quasi-polynomial time algorithm, uh, quasi-polynomial time approximation scheme uh, for a maximum weight independent set on H free graphs, where H is a force of paths and subdivided clause. So again, this is, this is like a one plus epsilon approximation algorithm. Uh, feedback vertex set on P5 free graphs was done um, by Abrashimi et al. in 2020. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, right, the independent set problem on PT free graphs uh, was done in quasi-polynomial time by Gartland and Lokshanov, the first two authors of this paper in 2020. And this was followed up by another quasi-polynomial time algorithm for the independent set problem in PT for graphs um, by Pilipchuk, Pilipchuk and Rajajewski, um, the other three authors of this paper. And uh, what they did here was that they simplified the algorithm of Gartland Lokshanov and they reduced the runtime. Um, and it's, it's a second um, independent set algorithm that is actually going to be the starting point for the algorithm that I'm presenting today. Okay, so what are some key components to our algorithm that I'm going to be presenting today? Uh, there's really five key ideas to our algorithm. Uh, so the first one is to how to extend that algorithm of Pilipchuk at L. That's, that was that second quasi-polynomial time algorithm for independent set on PT free graphs. Right, we need to figure out how do we extend that to allow for input of C sub greater than T free graphs as input. This is a strictly more general class of graphs. All right, uh, so we need to figure out how to do that extension. Uh, then our second key idea is how do we extend that algorithm, right, one, um, to find a maximum weight D degenerate subgraph. Right, so the algorithm for one only works for a maximum weight independent set, which is a zero degenerate graph. We want to generalize that to handle maximum weight D degenerate subgraphs, right, for arbitrary D. Uh, our third key idea um, is a proof that bounded degeneracy implies bounded tree width on C sub greater than T free graphs. Right, so some people that are listening that are familiar with uh, monadic second order logic may have been kind of surprised to see that our statement of our theorem had to do with bounded degeneracy, since MSO2 logic usually is related to graphs of bounded tree width. Um, so in general, degeneracy is, is less than tree width. Um, but it turns out that in C so greater than T free graphs, actually bounded degeneracy and bounded tree width are equivalent. Right? So that's our third key idea is the equivalency of bounded degeneracy and bounded tree width in the graphs we care about. Um, our fourth key idea is that um, in some sense, we can interpret the recursion tree um, from our algorithms from one, two, and three um, as being in some sense a tree decomposition of polylogarithmic tree width of our intended solution. All right. Um, and then our, our fifth key idea is that if we combine points three and four together, this actually allows us to uh, divide and conquer over CMSO2 equivalence classes. Okay. Um, so unfortunately, this is uh, much too many ideas to try and cover uh, just in this talk. So uh, I'm going to really focus on just trying to give the basic idea of the um, the Pilipchuk et al. algorithm, this uh, quasi-polynomial time independent set algorithm on PT free graphs, um, and also how to extend it to handle C sub greater than T free graphs. All right, so that's what I'm going to focus on for the rest of my talk. 
Okay, so a key idea for maximally independent set on PTF graphs um, is this idea of branching um, on a vertex, right? So this algorithm wants to find a vertex that's good for branching on. Um, and branching is the standard technique in the algorithm of graph theory. Uh, so what does it mean to branch on vertex V? It means that we solve the problem recursively, right? On one instance where we guess that V is not in uh, a maximum independent set S, right? And then we also solve it recursively uh, on one where we guess that V is in this like maximum independent set that we're trying to find to S, right? Um, so here, right, uh, we make one guess again where V is not in S. That's we're going to call that our failure branch. Um, and then in that case, right, if, if V is not in this maximum weight independent set, we can just remove V from G and solve this problem and get the exact same answer. Right, so what we do is just, we just look at G minus V and say, okay, recursively solve this problem, find a maximum weight independent set on this graph. All right, and then in our other branch, our success branch, where we guess that V is in S, well, we add V to our maximum weight independent set that we're keeping track of. And then we ask the algorithm to solve this problem recursively on G minus a closed neighborhood of V. Right, and we can do that because if, if V is in S, then no other vertex that V is neighbors with can be in S. So like we're free just to remove the closed neighborhood of V from G. And then now we say, okay, solve this problem recursively now. Our final maximum weight independence in G minus the closed neighborhood of V. All right, and then we get the return of both of these solutions, and then we just return whichever one is larger. Okay. Um, so another key idea of this algorithm um, are balanced separators. So a balanced separator of a graph G is a set S such that no connected component of G minus S has over half of G's vertices. And so here's a picture of a balanced separator. Here's our graph G. If we removed S from this graph, you can kind of see that all these connected components now are kind of small. None of them have more than half of the vertices of G. Okay, so that's what a balanced separator is. All right, so there is one last idea that I have to give you before I can uh, talk about how the algorithm works. Um, so that's the Gerhardt-Foss path growing argument. And it states that if G is a PT free graph, then there exists a balanced separator path X, um, which is an induced path of length of most T, and the closed neighborhood of X is a balanced separator. And so here's like a little picture of that would look like. Um, right, so we have a P4 drawn here, and then we have its closed neighborhood, and the closed neighborhood of this P4 would be a balanced separator of our graph. Okay, so how does the algorithm work? Um, well, we find a balanced um, separator path X of length of most T. And one of the vertices of X, we'll call it V, it must intersect a large fraction of the induced paths of G um, with its closed neighborhood. Well, why is that? Well, if it was true that none of the vertices of X, um, if, if, if all the vertices of X, if their closed neighborhood only intersected a few of the induced paths of X. But then when we looked at G minus the closed neighborhood of X, the large majority of induced paths would still remain intact, meaning that um, most of the vertices would still have paths going between each other. Uh, so G minus the closed neighborhood of X would actually still have some very large connected component, right? But we're assuming that the closed neighborhood of X is a balanced separator. All right, um, so, Right, so one of the vertices of X, we'll call it V, it has to intersect a large fraction of the induced paths um, of G. And it's also important um, that there's only polynomially many induced paths of G, right? So there's the most n to the T induced paths of G because we're working in a PT free graph. Okay, so what is the idea? Well, we branch on V, right? We find this V that intersects a lot of the paths, we branch on V, and branching on this path um, efficiently reduces the number of induced paths of G, right? Because in our success branch, when we assume that V is an S, we remove V and we remove its closed neighborhood, meaning that we've now destroyed many induced paths of G, right? And that quickly breaks up our graph into smaller connected components. And then from there, we can just divide and conquer over the connected components. All right, and that's the algorithm. Okay, so um, let's see how to extend this to C so greater than TP graphs. Um, so luckily this Gyarkov's path growing argument also holds for these graphs. And that was shown by Chudnovsky at L. Um, so let me just restate what it says, is that if G is a C so greater than T free graph, then there exists a balanced separator path X 
um, which is an induced path of length at most t, and the closed neighborhood of x is a balanced separator. Okay, but there's kind of a problem here. Um, and that's that branching on a vertex that hits many induced paths, it no longer works. Right? There can now be exponentially many paths, induced paths in G. Right? In PT free graphs, there's only polynomially many induced paths, but in C sub greater than T free graphs, there can be many exponentially many induced paths. That's a, that's a problem for our algorithm. Um, so we still use balanced separator paths to guide branching, like in PT free graphs, um, but we must try and hit another structure. A different kind of structure, which we call tripods, um, of which there's only polynomially many tripods. Okay, so let me tell you what tripods are now. And um, there's a closely related structure to tripods called connectors, which I'll I will have to explain as well. Um, so here are the two types of connectors um, that we can have. We basically that these connectors basically just look like keys, right? Um, so there's these two types of connectors, um, and there's uh, so each connector has three tips. Those are the endpoints, right, of the connector. Um, and they also have a center, right? So this first kind of connector here just has a single vertex as its center. This second kind of connector has this triangle as its center. Okay. Um, so every triple of vertices in the same connector component induces a connector um, where they are the tips of that connector. Right? So you can kind of, you can show that every triple of vertices, there exists a connector every triple of vertices in the same connector component such that those triple of vertices are the tips of this connector. Um, now a tripod is a connector with arms at length at most t divided by two. Right, so tripod is just connectors with kind of short arms. Um, and it, the arm is basically if we just if we start off by the center, right, the arms are just the paths that emit from this center here. Right, so um, yes, the tripod is a connector with uh, short arms emitting from the center. And it's, it, we can see, right, that every connector contains a tripod, right, which is its, its center tripod, right? If you look at the center, and you just kind of look at the paths of length t divided by two that emit from the center, that's our, that's our center tripod. Okay, so the following one that gives us our motivation for actually looking at tripods and connectors. Um, and what this one basically says is that if t is a connector of g, Right, and X is a balanced separator path such that all the tips of T get placed into different components of G minus the closed neighborhood of X, then the closed neighborhood of X must intersect the central tripod of T. Okay, so let's just look at a quick proof by picture of this. Um, so this yellow set here is the closed neighborhood of X, and this black path here is some subpath of X. Uh, right, so if the closed neighborhood of X uh, doesn't intersect the central tripod of this connector here, um, then we can actually make a long and do cycle just by taking this left arm here of the central tripod and this bottom arm here of the central tripod, and then connecting the endpoints just using this black path here. And that's going to create a long induced cycle. All right, so now we can look at the maximum weight independent set on C sub greater than T free graphs. All right, so let's see how this algorithm works. Um, so if there exists a balanced uh, separator path X, such that no connected component of G minus the closed neighborhood of X has over one fourth of G's vertices, um, then there exists a vertex V of X whose closed neighborhood intersects many tripods of G. And so why is that? Well, if such a balanced separator path X exists, um, then you can show that the tips of many connectors will lie in different components of G minus the closed neighborhood of X. And by that observation that we just saw before, that implies that the closed neighborhood of X intersects many of the tripods of G then. All right, so the closed neighborhood of X intersects many of the tripods of G. And using the same reasoning that we saw before for PT free graphs, right? Just like in PT free graphs, there existed a vertex V that hit many of the induced paths of G. In this case, there must be some vertex V of X whose closed neighborhood intersects many of the tripods of G. Okay, so what do we do with that vertex V? Well, we just branch on V. And just like in PT graphs again, um, branching on V is going to efficiently remove many of the tripods of G, and that's going to break up G into small connected components. All right, but the problem is though, is that such a balanced path separator X might not exist, 
right? We might not have this one fourth fraction. Um, our lemma only guaranteed that such a balanced path separate exists with this fraction being one half, right? And one fourth, of course, is a stronger statement. Uh, so such a balanced path separator might not exist. Uh, luckily, though, in that case, when such a balanced path separator doesn't exist, um, what we can do is that we can actually show that we can fix a balanced separator path x. And then we can essentially revert back to branching on vertices whose closed neighborhood intersects many induced paths, similar to what we did for PT free graphs. All right, so either there exists a balanced path separator x um, such that no cut component of g minus x is over one fourth of these vertices, in which case we branch on v, and then we efficiently break up the graph into small cut components, and then we recurse on those components. Or no such x no such x exists. But in that case, we can kind of revert back to our old branching strategy for PT free graphs. And then we do that kind of branching. And again, we break up many of our, um, then we, we again, by this branching, we're going to break up our graph into small connected components. And then we recurse on these connected components, just like in PT free graphs. All right, and then uh, that's basically the algorithm for extending it to C sub greater than T free graphs. All right, so unfortunately, uh, I think that's all that I have time for to cover today. Um, so thanks for coming to my talk. And of course, if you come to my poster session, I'd be happy to talk about other aspects of this algorithm.